Relax, have a ciggy. You're listening to The Power Movement. Welcome to The Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I have a good friend slash former kind of co-worker, but really he was one of my competitors when I was at K2. I'm talking about Josh Malchek. And Josh is the global brand director for Line Skis and Full Tilt Boots, and he's one of the smartest people behind the scenes in the world of skiing. The cool thing about Josh's story is that he started from the bottom. This is the story of a kid who had no problem working for free to eventually secure a job in an industry that is his passion. Kids, if you're listening, or even young adults who want to make it in the world of snow, Josh has a lot of lessons to share that could help you land your dream job. Before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement and tell your friends about the show. If you ever have any questions for me, you can reach me at mike at thepowellmovement.com. I will get back to you. Hopefully everyone is getting their time on the hill. I know I have been, and I need to thank Kelly Carter and the good folks at Stevens Pass for letting me play on their amazing mountain. Now I want to thank the people who make this show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Spy Optic. Now, let's talk to Josh Malchek. Josh, your last name is one of those tongue twisters that everyone messes up, and given I've known you for like 12 years so I can say your name correctly, (laughs) How does it get pronounced wrong? There's many, many ways. Malkazak, Malakazi. I mean, it's all consonants. I mean, M-A-L-C-Z-Y-K. So people will just sometimes just stop. They'll, they'll get to the M-A-L and then they're like, whoa, what's going on here? And then I'll finish it. One of the reasons why I was never a household name or pro skier. One of the small reasons, I guess. Talent is one of those things, too. And last names are huge with that. When you think of Fuhas and Morrison, they, they just roll off the tongue. Malchek Fuhas. doesn't. <laughs> I said Fugis. For, I still don't even know how to say it. I know Pep. I asked him one time, how do you pronounce your name Fuhas or Fugis? And he was kind of like, ah, just depends how I feel. That's how I am, too. And I met a Polish person. It's a Polish name. And they're like, oh, it's Malchik. And I'm like, really? I've been saying Malchik my entire life and everyone else has. And they're like, oh, that's kind of not how you say it. But whatever. I like Malchik. Josh, there's a different time in the world where we could tell jokes and say all kinds of things. And that has totally changed now. But when you bring up Polish, there were a lot of jokes that went with that as well. And do you have a favorite that you heard in your childhood? I mean, there's always the standard ones, the submarine with the screen door or the Solar-powered flashlight, that's about it. I've never been. I'd like to go. You've never been. You've been everywhere. What's your travel situation been like this fall, and what's it going to be like this winter? Tomorrow, I'm actually going to Hawaii, super last minute of just getting out of this insane rain, and that's a vacation, vacation, which is great. And previous to that, starting in the summer, I went over to our boot factory. I do full tilt boots also. That's in Montebelluna, Italy, a little town called Asolo next to it, actually. And we were doing a factory visit, seeing how everything's going. I hadn't been there for about five years, so that was a very nice trip. And then sales meeting in Europe for about a week in Garmisch, Bartenkirchen, Germany, near where our headquarters is. And Jackson Hole in December before Christmas to test some skis. That's basically it. Back and forth the hood a lot. And then this winter, we have a bunch of Europe trips and a ton of trips everywhere. Because it seems like with your life and how it's developed, you've been on the road way too much. And it's just part of your job. Yeah, it's one of those things where people are like, oh, cool. You got like status and stuff on an airline. It's like, yeah, it's not that cool because that just means you're on airplanes a lot. But yeah, I'm going to Japan for an Eric Pollard, first of its kind, Eric Pollard, Rizutsu art show, film showing, skiing with Eric. It's going to be really cool. In two weeks, I believe. I've never been to Hokkaido, so that'll be exciting. It's always good to go with Pollard. Well, you have come a long way from Connecticut, and we're going to talk about your life and times. But it all starts right outside of New York City in Connecticut. From people that aren't from like New England or America, I usually just say I'm from New York City because it's the closest thing. But it's actually, Southington, Connecticut is in the middle of Connecticut. But when I say I'm from Connecticut, I always follow that with, I'm from normal Connecticut. My parents are teachers, and I, not the Fairfield County, uh, Stanford thing. Nothing against that. I know a lot of nice people there with the New York crowd and everything, but not the Connecticut that you see on the news or in movies and the Kennedys and stuff. Well, they're from Massachusetts, I guess. But So your family wasn't commuting into the city and not spending any time with you during the day. That was totally different. They were actually teachers who probably spent a shit ton of time with you. Oh, yeah. You. 
and from what I hear, you come from a really hardcore ski family. Like, it's not just something you got into. It was, I won't say you were forced into it because you probably wanted to do it. But uh, it was, definitely. Your mom and dad, serious skiers? Yeah, I mean, my mom, not so much, but my dad was. And oh, we was a skiing family, and there was six of us. So I have two older brothers and older sister. So with four kids and teachers, they were really smart. They realized at a young age that they'll never go on vacations <laughs> ever because it just costs so much money to get on a plane or do whatever. So... They invested in this tiny little house in Vermont, and we went up there, and that was our, our vacation spot for my entire life. Like 1987, I think they bought this place, and I still have it. Is that Okimo? Okimo, which means all come home in Native American, I don't know which tribe, but now purchased by Vail Resorts. Oh, wow. Yep. Are they worried about that, or are they excited for the infrastructure that will be built? <laughs> well, there's definitely a, a season pass infrastructure that Vail's been building on, and you know, the jury's out there on what's going on with what Vail's going to do, but they're learning a little bit. My father was saying that they're going to be a little bit more strict on off-trail policy. You know, you can't cut ropes as much, and it's not as loose, independent ski place, because we can actually ski from the bottom lift. Our house is on the mountain. It's not on a trail. We can ski from a lower lift on the south face down through the woods, pretty much, and get to our house. And my father, he even named the trail, and I won't say it on the air, because it's secret trail and everyone will end up at the malchex and at the malchex it's pretty flat definitely woodsy but now you can ski right to our place but you just have to duck a rope and go into the woods which is fine for us but who knows that's one change i think okimo had this cool program of kids that were on like free school lunches or discounted lunches they got discounted tickets and passes and that was always a thing up there and they came in and took it away and there was like a community uproar where and actually to Vail's credit they put it back in which is pretty sweet Getting the people who couldn't afford it back on the mountain sounds like Vale's style. <laughs> it's listening to your, your consumer base. I mean, how many areas do they own right now? I don't want to make this podcast about Vail, but there's a lot. So every community is completely different. This last round of purchases of Stevens Pass and Crested Butte and Okemo and Mount Sunapee, those are small resorts. I mean, well, they went with super small resorts, which like Afton Alps and the guys in the Midwest, which are feeder hills to Vale and Keystone and Breck. But now it's like the mid-size resorts, which is interesting. So there's community there for sure. And there's a lot of bars. There's a lot of independent retailers and things like that. So we will see what they will do. All right. Well, when does skiing get serious for you? Because I'm sure your parents get you up to the mountain every weekend. And when do you start focusing on watching videos and getting into the scene? Because while you're not a pro athlete, we really don't need to start talking about your ski career. But you <laughs> do have a ski career. So we will talk oh, about yeah. it. Oh, yeah illustrious ski career that's what got me sitting here talking to you right now i guess but i started skiing when i was one and a half so i can't remember it actually but when did you get serious you know you start skiing when you're one and a half and your parents get you to where you can actually make turns but when do you buy your first movie because i'm guessing that you were a full-on grom when you were first a movie well it was high school actually which is interesting because you know I skied the whole life fifth grade snowboarding was hot and all my friends snowboarded and i want to try it and we were a ski family. I was kind of disowned for a little bit when I bought my own snowboard at Ocean State Job Lot. It's this like super discount place in, in Connecticut and Rhode Island. For like 75 bucks, it was called a Shove It, actually. It was terrible. And I think I got bindings off of like East Bay or one of those catalogs that would be shipped to you. And kind of taught myself how to snowboard. And so that was fifth grade to like eighth grade. But I still love skiing, but skiing was boring at the time. You know, I had Rosnell 9Ss and just like going down. Bumps were like the coolest thing there was and catching a little air. This is like 96, 97-ish? I'd say like 90. Yeah, you're right. That was a long time ago. And so, yeah, I got my first pair of carving skis, uh, Tita Star 4x4s, which were totally cool. They had flames on them. That was cool, but snowboarding, I was into it. So it's my dirty little secret of a guy who runs a ski company is I still love snowboarding, and I snowboard every year, and I follow it a lot. And it's more comparable to the types of skis that we make and marketing we do to that than normal skiing. So I was always a skier, but the snowboarding was there. So there was those like middle school years where I'd bring both to the hill. I would switch out snowboarding halfway through the day. I think it was eighth grade or so. When was the Nagano Olympics? It was 98. <laughs> and so to Johnny Big Air Mosley's credit, I'd say like he won the moguls and he did a 360 mute grab. And he looked back at the time and it, like he looked like such a kooky, that bull of hat on and super American stuff going on, the K2 skis. But. At that time, it was super cool. And I'm like, well, that guy just grabbed his skis. Snowboarders grabbed their skis. And he was wearing like loose pants. I'm like, 
I could probably do that. And then from there, I bought like a pair of Burton pants that weren't black. And I was like, oh, I'm definitely a freestyler. I could do 360s, but then I never really thought about grabbing my ski. And then I was like, no, I could totally do that. So the next week I went out and built a jump in Mount Southington and did a 360 mute grab. And I was like, wow, that was super easy. And from there, it kind of snowballed into more freestyle stuff. That's when I probably got my first movie. I think it was Poor Boy's Propaganda. No, it was before that. It was like TGR, like The Realm or something like that. Were you one of those kids that was wearing out the videos and your VHS? The freestyle parts for sure. But that was like the time when it was like Micah Black and like some super weird comedic reliefs type stuff. And I like the freestyle parts, but they were more like mashups and it was like footage they can get from other people. And so I just go to like Candy's parts. I mean, I was a kid from the East Coast. Powder and cliff jumps and stuff were just not a thing that was afforded to me or I cared about. So it was more like, what's Vincent Dorian doing now? Or what's Dave Crichton doing? Which came a little later. I learned my first backflip in like eighth grade too. So that was game changer. Found like a straight up and down jump that like the mogul team at Okemo was hitting. And I was always a private citizen. I never was a part of a club or whatever like that. I was kind of hated those kids. And I was like, can I hit this jump? And it was like the perfect time to like try and learn a backflip. And I did it. I over rotated. I was like, holy shit, that is easy to do. (laughs) And it turned out the backflip was like easier to do than a 360. And it was like, okay, I could do this now off of everything. And from that point on, it was like, okay, I just need to find bigger jumps to do tricks slower. The fear factor was not there at all. Now it's full on fear. Like how small can I go? You know, at the time it was great. Got my first twin tips, K2 enemies. And from there, that was it. And so you get into high school and you're full on back into skiing. You probably snowboard here and there a little bit, but skiing has taken back over and you've seen Johnny Mosley. And (laughs) in high school, I would think, A lot of the stuff that's going on is up more in New England. While you're in Connecticut, I feel like you go up more towards Vermont. That's where all the rail jams and everything's going on. Are you pretty much a traveling kid every weekend going to different contests? Yeah, I'd say that was probably like my junior, senior year of high school. And I had one other friend in Southington that was a freestyle skier. This kid, Sean Mindcheck, who's actually an amazing artist. He was rad. He had like the Volant machetes and stuff. Yep. He and I... We'd go back and forth in the home hill and then, yeah, all the comps and all the things to get the big parks were in Vermont. So home base was our house in Vermont and went to Mount Snow constantly, met some crew there, met some guys at Okemo and kind of made my skiing there and kind of fell in love with it a lot more. Before it was just the thing you do with your family. It was fun and I enjoyed it. And I was pretty good at it, chasing my older brothers and sister around. But from there, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And this is an interesting story because it was a really bad thing. Senior year, I had like broken up with my girlfriend. It was like first love. And I was like, whatever. And I was at like a homecoming dance or something like that. I got super drunk and I, by accident, borrowed my friend's car. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I definitely like took my friend's car down the hill from my friend's house, kind of crashed it and parked it at the bottom of the hill and walked home. And the next day, my mother wakes me up and is like, do you know what you did last night? I'm like, uh, no. And it was like serious trouble. Cops weren't involved or anything like that. It was just like full on parenting. Like, this is bad. You're an idiot. Worst feeling in my life of like, I am the stupidest kid in the world. Kind of crashed it. How much damage are we talking about? It was like 1500 bucks, And my friend Brandon was so pissed off. And it was one of those moments where I was like, I have never been in this trouble before in my life. This is bad. And from there, I was like, this is kind of a toxic world down here in Connecticut for me right now. And my parents, they're pretty traditional people. I mean, my mom is the scarier one. She's a kindergarten teacher and she could yell at you badly. And my dad is a high school teacher and he could, but like it was more the mom. And at that point, I decided I was just going to go to Vermont and go skiing a lot more and just remove myself from Connecticut and the party scene and stuff. I went up there and I made a lot more friends and I was way more motivated to learn new tricks. And in that winter, I probably learned like 10 or 15 new tricks. And at the time, it wasn't like you're looking at like a how-to video on YouTube. Like what there is now, I can learn freestyle as like a student of this thing that's already been put there. We were building our own jumps in Connecticut and then the jumps in Vermont were just bigger and there was no science involved in them. But it was like, how can you do a misty flip? And you see one guy do it. You see Pep do like a misty seven. You're like, okay, if I roll my shoulder like this or whatever, you were just ticking off this like list of new things to do. And I got pretty good and I was pretty confident with myself. And from there, I was like, okay, skiing is something I'm really into and it's going to form my, I mean, I wasn't thinking about my life at the time, but the next like four years of my life was college. And it was like, okay. I want to go to college somewhere where there's skiing. And from there, I applied to UC Boulder and UVM and Castleton and Green Mountain College and I think Champlain too. 
And I wasn't the best student, but I got into all of them. <laughs> and I didn't think I was going to get into Boulder. And that was kind of one of those like, oh, okay, Boulder or UVM. That was the big deal. And I think if you talk to anybody at Boulder, they're like, I applied at UVM. You talk to anyone at UVM, they applied at Boulder. Right. The downtowns are the same place. Like Pearl Street in Boulder is the same as Church Street in Burlington. It was designed by the same guy. So they're super similar. And at one point, I think my parents had kind of a coming to Jesus. They're like, okay, do you want to pay student loans for a little bit of your life or the rest of your life? Because <laughs> if you want to go to Boulder, we're not going to come visit you. It's a plane flight. It's so much more expensive. And UVM was the choice. And so I went to UVM. And you already had a ton of friends up there, right? Yeah. I mean, some of my Okimo guys went up there. And my friend Paul, he was a few years older. He went to Champlain. And my brother had gone to UVM. I was really familiar with it. It was four and a half hours away from home. So it wasn't like a plane flight. So it was, it was far enough away to get distance, not just going to UConn or something like that. So yeah, it was the choice. And, and I went up there in 2003, I think. We don't really need to talk about what you studied in college a lot, but what did you study? Recreation management with a focus in applied design. So like graphic design and some art classes. And I took like welding classes too. There was just a lot of different random stuff. And then recreation management was in the School of Natural Resources, which is pretty interesting. And so I took a bunch of ecology classes and a lot of things that I have knowledge about now that have nothing to do with my career at all. But it was cool because it got me out there and it got me to meet a lot of more people that were in the outdoor world. I mean, at UVM, people went skiing. I don't know why you would go there if you didn't ski or like the cold or outdoors because it's miserable in the wintertime, but awesome town. And the East Coast at that point, they had a ton of contests going on, it seemed like, while you were in school. Oh, yeah. The Vermont Open was the one that everyone seemed to look forward to every year, at least from what I remember. And were you at the last Vermont Open? Because I believe there was some crazy snowball fight or something. Oh, no, I missed that one. That was like one little generation below me. My time was more of like the pig air at Mount Snow, the mega mother hucker. And once I got kind of a crew of skiers in Burlington, I met this guy, Justin Galern. He's actually in the movie Wicked. Okay. If there's any East Coast skiers in here, that was the movie. Neil Sekatapalop. I still can't pronounce his last name, but super Greek name. One of the smartest guys I've ever known. And he went to RPI and his crew, the Mount Snow crew, they put that on. And so we'd go down there a lot. And where was I going with this story? You're talking about contests. Oh, yeah, contests. Well, there was like money in them. Not a lot, but like 200 bucks or 300 bucks or something like that. Do you ever win? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I won one contest. I won an Okimo Slope Style. And I remember that was the first time I met Liam Downey and Derek Click. And there was rails in the Slope Style. And rails were not really a thing yet. I see Liam and he's just like, that's Derek Click. He's won every big air competition. He never falls or whatever. And then he's going on his run. I see him fall and I'm like, sick. And I didn't fall and I did the rail. So I won, I don't know, 200 bucks or something like that. But that's a ton of money when you're 17 or 18. You've got a win on your resume, yeah. Josh. There was definitely a printout somewhere with Liam's name on there and Derek's name. And I was like pretty stoked on that because those guys were the bosses back then. And yeah, I did a whole bunch of those. And the other reason for going to competitions was it was usually where the best jumps were because parks sucked. But if there was going to be a comp with people coming, they would put a little bit more effort into making something. And you were you know, allowed to hit the biggest jump without waiting in line or sometimes it was like snowmobile toes up the hill and all these little things that really made it a lot more cool. I mean, if there was like chalk on the jump, that was like next level. Yeah. So it was, it was awesome. But there was that. And then freshman, sophomore year, it was a lot of traveling around, a lot of skiing at Stowe and Sugarbush. Yeah, that's kind of when my crew was all very like-minded and there was snowboarder skiers and we figured it out from there. Okay. Well, before we get any further, I'm going to take a quick break, talk about my sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo. And if you haven't been to one of their stores in Denver, Seattle, Portland, or Whistler, you are missing out on the best retail experience in snow. But don't worry. If you can't get to a store, you can find all the brands at the best prices over at Evo.com. You'll also get a low price guarantee, free shipping on orders over $50, and a no-hassle return policy. Evo is different than your traditional retailers, and they're committed to creating a great experience for you, giving back to those who need it, and creating community. They make a difference in a space where most don't, and that's worth supporting. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and if you're a listener of the show, you've heard me talk about how Rescue Water is proactive recovery. You've heard me tell you that there is nothing that will hydrate you better than a Rescue Water, but have you tried it? If you haven't, you're missing out on feeling better and more hydrated after a workout, a day on the hill, or doing whatever athletic endeavor you're into. And on the nightlife side, drink one rescue water before bed and you will feel 100% in the morning. 
please do me and yourself a favor and pick up some rescue water next time you're at the store or on Amazon. If you head on over to rescuewater.com, you'll get 20% off a 12, 24, or 48 pack when you enter the code RESCUEWATERTPM, that's R-E-S-Q Water T-P-M, all one word at checkout. Those are my sponsors, so we can get right back into it. I think it's around 2004 when your first big video part comes out with <laughs> Right Side Productions. Right Side Productions is what we should talk about, for sure. What was the video called? Eft. E-P-H-E-D. We had a sense of humor back then, because everything was just effed. I don't know, we were too much of good boys to call it fucked or something like that. These days, you could do that, but the Right Side Productions, that was my friend Joe Gatani, snowboarder. He's one of the major video bosses of the East Coast right now. He runs a firm called Driven in Burlington. He's done videos for Bernie Sanders, and he does all the stuff for Ben and Jerry's. Super big time stuff, but at the time, he had a video camera, and... We wanted to film what we were doing, and there was a lot of urban rails in, in Burlington. And so we kind of just went out and did a lot of urban rails. So Right Side Productions, it was a fake film company that was used to get discounted tickets at Sugarbush and all these things. But we were making videos for Sugarbush. All we wanted was free passes or free gear. And from there, I'd write up a proposal. We'll make you like seven videos for the year, and you give us free passes. That was the business transaction, which was awesome for us. But another one was we wanted to slide rails on campus. And... With that, you know, you're going to get busted. The cops are going to come and like yeah. kick you out. The end around with that was like, okay, well, if we really want to slide this rail, if we want to do something on campus and not have to go somewhere else, we can get insurance. And so with that, we figured out that this guy down the street, Jason Leventhal, who ran Line Skis, which was down the street in Burlington at the time on Flint Avenue, he had an insurance policy. You needed a million dollar insurance policy to run an event on campus. The school guys were like, yeah, Line Skis is going to put up their insurance policy for this thing. So we were covered. And so that was the in of event management. And then, you know, we, we made the movies and, and we marketed and had premieres in town. It was just total local hero type stuff. But it was a vehicle to actually do things we wanted to do. So that's your hustle. That's how you're getting lift tickets yeah. and different things. But I was coming to this movie because when I see it, it's a totally different Josh Malchek that oh, I know. Oh, geez, I'm going to get at least like 10 more views on this video. It's on YouTube if you want to find it. It's got like 46 views. And oh, damn. No, I'm kidding. I don't know how many views it has, but what you do have that you don't have now is a full head of hair. Oh, yeah. I think it was You're, pink, too. I don't know, because I think there were bandanas around it, and I think you were dancing behind girls. A totally different Josh <laughs> than I've ever seen. Was that who you were your sophomore year in college? Were you kind of like street thug Josh, or are you yeah. the guy writing proposals in the background? That was a persona, and I mean, obviously the internet's forever, so that's definitely on there, but it was a joke. Like, at the time, hip-hop was like, it was more like hardcore rap was like the thing that white kids from the suburbs were listening to, and I was just like, I want to do something like this and make it like this funny-ass part. You know, you always need filler in a part. You can't get that many clips, so like, to have a two-minute part, you needed some like funny lifestyle filler, so there was a school dance at Champlain College, <laughs> and uh, my friend at the time was working for Tech Nine Snowboards, and that was in Burlington, and... They were very kind and giving us a bunch of their gear. And I had this full gold velour jumpsuit. That was just like the funniest thing to wear. So yeah, the video I'm wearing a Tech 9 jumpsuit and dancing around and it's just silly. It was just having a good time in comparison. The whole like 4x9 crew and the guys then like at the time, like giant clothing was the coolest thing to do. So you're clowning it. Yeah. And in the real world, it's just like, whatever, you're just a skier and you're just a white kid that goes to college. But like you wanted to have something a little different. So that thought was there so and you can see that because then you fast forward to amateur hour which is a couple years <laughs> later and it's a full inspirational classical music almost intro into metal i don't know what band it is dragon force okay. yeah and that was just like you just found a song and you're like this is hilarious i want to like put this over skiing and at that time i was working in a parking garage and sitting in the parking garage booth and i had my computer and I could do my homework and edit videos like in this parking garage booth. It was one of the best jobs. If any college kids are out there, get in the parking industry as a college student because there's really not that much responsibility. You kind of just got to show up and like be there and then leave. Like So valet and parking, sitting in a parking garage is totally awesome. But with all that, I got a little bit of sponsorship from the Line Skis like New England rep with this guy named Jake Anderson, who was uh, a rad dude. And to be a sophomore in college and having like a line skis van show up and some dude handing you skis for free in your dorm like that was pretty cool yeah i got that one and then i sent a video into spider there was a spider venom house team yeah i remember the venom team 
Jamie Burge and Oh, it worked. It was a great marketing thing. I got to give them to that. I wish they did more in marketing. But I sent in a VHS tape of, I don't know what part it was. Supposedly, C.R. Johnson watched it and they're writers and they picked the Venom House team. And I got a bunch of stuff. Like free socks was the biggest one. Like they sent me a bunch of socks. I didn't think about it for that long. And then four or five years later, when we were signing Tom Walsh to Full Tilt, he had the same sticker on his thing. And I'm like, dude. That's the Venom House Team sticker. He's like, yeah, I was on it. And I like went back and I found a list of who was on the Venom House Team, which I was one of them. It was like Julian Carr and like Tom Wallish and like some other guys. And I was like, holy shit, this is crazy. Like a legendary list of people. Time. Well, at the time when the list came out, it was just people that you had no idea who they were. And, you know, half the people on there, you still don't know who they were. But like Wallish is on it. It was so funny. But that was cool. It, it gave me a natural motivation to think I was going to be a pro skier at some point. You've got that motivation. But in that video amateur hour, one thing I noticed was I haven't seen one person have skis pre-release while spinning like you have in like five clips in that video. And that has to be the scariest possible thing that can happen to you when you're in the air. They were like next year's line skis. I think Jason gave me some demos of like some chronic blends. They used to be called the chronic blenders, blend chronic or something Something like it was like the same ski. And there were total demo skis I didn't like. Check the bindings. Check bindings or do anything to. And that was at the Loon competition that was like in May. The hike and huck. So basically they took all the snow in their park and pushed into one big jump. And it was like May. So everything was melted out. And it was just this big ass party and this huge jump. And that was a good time. That was totally awesome. I mean, I think on that jump, I like concussed myself for sure. But it was at the time where you could just throw yourself off and just about anything. Yeah. And that was super cool. You mentioned that you met Jason Leventhaler. You mentioned Jason had an insurance policy, but you meet Jason. He's going to change your life. And he's a guy who changed the sport with product. Back in the day, he's like the original ski boss before Tanner Hall came around. If you thought about an independent ski boss, it was Jason Leventhal running the East Coast. Literally. And I did a podcast with Jason. Everybody else in the world has done a podcast with Jason or have seen him speak somewhere because okay. Jason does speak a lot. But His story keeps evolving, and your career, I feel like, starts with Jason Leventhal. While you were a passionate skier, that doesn't take you to the next level, but Jason Leventhal does. And how does your first interactions, and how do you meet Jason? I just started showing up at the office. I needed an internship for college, and I knew him, and I think I emailed him once, and he got back to me. I was like, dude, do you need any interns? And he he had a revolving door of interns, and anyone that works in the snow sports industry, you can get a lot of interns, because it's a really cool thing to get into. And he's like, yeah, here's where the address is. Just show up. And I kind of just started showing up. And I did a year-long internship. Like, you could do a half a year, which was like three credits. But a year was like six. And I'm like, oh, I can totally hack the system here and just basically do this for this long and get a bunch of credits. And yeah, that was probably like junior year or sophomore year or something like that. And it was super close. And I learned a lot. I basically sat in his office. I sat next to him. And so just listening in on conversations. This was a weird time in Lion Ski's world because they had the sickest team, a lot of style, like the Pollard and Scogin and Dash and all those guys were, were there. And unbeknownst to the intern, <laughs> the, the finances weren't really lining up. Like it was when the binding came out. And Were you a guinea pig for that binding? I was. I have a hat that says line reactor test team on it. Oh. At 130 pounds in college, I never broke product ever. <laughs> and I broke a lot of those things. And the marketing and the concept of that binding was, was genius. I mean, it, the way it released, it would have hindered it's like the knee binding which is still out but it never really made the mainstream it could actually hinder backwards twisting falls crashes which is how you blow your knee it's pretty much because the force on the back of your ankle is way more than your toe to pop out and no bindings in the world release on the on the ankle and that thing released on the ankle the concept was great the the marketing was awesome it sold in really well but just the execution making it like any product that has like a thousand moving parts in it it kind of blew up and that added to the financial demise of line for i guess the second time listeners here can reference jason's podcast with you before i think he goes through a lot of that stuff yeah i mean i think it's about that time that they got bought by trek sport or trek uh that was 2000 that was the first time jay went bankrupt and it was not bankrupt but like just needed more help in in manufacturing things like that so line was bought in in 2000 by track sports usa that's when it moved from albany up to burlington so when you started with Jason, Track Sports owned yep. Line. So yeah, it was the Line Carhu office. Okay, and it was next to Gravis and Select Design, which is a t-shirt and swag design company, which is a really cool area. I mean, the office was totally rad. I mean, it was like ten or fifteen people there. And as a college kid, you go in there and you just see these big pictures on the wall of like Pollard and 
Skogan and stuff, and you're just like, this is the center of the brand and, and the type of skiing that I, I'm subscribed to. So I was working for free for a long time, and so it was totally fine. And are they constantly fucking with you too because you are the intern? Not really. I mean, it's East Coast nice, and I had to do a lot of random stuff. I mean, I was definitely a stand-in for soft goods photography and just, just doing basically everything. In line skis world, when I was the intern, it was a year-long internship, and that was 2006. And so I was going through it. It was all good. And then one day I woke up and I went on New Schoolers, and I just see this headline, like, Lion Skis bought by K2 Sports. And you're like, what the hell just happened? And like, obviously, that information wasn't privy to the intern. So I walk into the office. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, we were basically going to go out of business. And Lion is a great brand, but just no back-end money or manufacturing. And so the CEO at the time of K2 saw that and they bought him. And so it kept line going. I mean, it wouldn't exist without K2 Sports. It was a big deal at the time because that was the first independent ski brand of the big three, which was Forefront, Armada, and Line. Yep. And suddenly people were like, Line's a bunch of sellouts. Jay's rich as hell. He just <laughs> sold this thing. And in the, the story in the back end, which is on the internet, basically anywhere of any of Jay's podcasts, is you know, it was a hustle and it was a struggle. And K2 has, has kept Line going for that long. And since then, it made it thrive for sure. But as the intern, I didn't know any of the stuff in the back end. And when it came, I was like, okay. And so within six or seven months, even less than that, that office had shut down. I mean, some people that were there were offered jobs in, in Seattle and had moved and some people didn't. And it was pretty stressful. These guys were definitely in some stress. And I, I hope I never have to experience something like that. But yeah, from there, I assumed Jay and everyone would just move to Seattle and that was it. That was a cool time in my life. And Lionel will be based in Seattle, which is a place I had no idea where that was and really far away. But after six or seven months, Jay never really left. He was just in his house. And I'm like, are you moving to Seattle? And at first he was thinking about it and then he didn't. I mean, Vermont's an amazing place. He has a kid there and a wife and, and a whole community. So he never left. And by the grace of K2 Sports, they let him work from Vermont. And is this around the same time that you take a job at the Meatheads? Not yet. This is before I graduated college. So okay. this is probably my senior year. So Jay never left. So from there, I was still kind of involved. There's a new rep in New England and I knew him. He's still our rep, Rich Anderson, rad dude. And kind of just doing my thing and looking towards the future and trying to figure out that big black hole of what's next after college. And I graduated college and I didn't want to move back to Connecticut. And I stayed up in Vermont and I got an internship with the Meathead Films Productions. Meathead, the brand name isn't really there anymore. It's Ski the East, which is a clothing brand, very East Coast centric skiing clothing brand, totally rad. The two dudes, Chris James and Jeff McDonald, still crushing it. I'd stopped in on those guys a few months ago, actually, when I was back East. And yeah, they're like, ah, come on, show up. And they paid me like 150 bucks a week. <laughs> <laughs> I was graduated. It was money coming in for something that came really natural to me was like editing videos. And I don't even think social media, I think MySpace was there at the time. And just doing a lot of digital stuff for them and packing boxes, doing all the random stuff and just showing up at their house, which was their office, and doing that for, I don't know, two or three months, I think. And yeah, that was a good time of, of my life. And then from there, I got a job at the ski rack. I always wanted a job at a ski shop, but in order to get a job at a ski shop, you always needed experience at a ski shop. I never understood that. And I talked to a lot of college kids and everything being like, how do I get into the industry? It's like, well, you get some experience. And they're like, well, how do I get experience? There's no jobs for me. I'm like, just show up and just do an internship or do things for free for a while and see where that takes you and keep your eyes open for opportunities. And I kind of talked my way into working at the ski rack. And that was the summer after I graduated. And you're a killer salesman. I was the worst salesman on the planet. I was on the floor and retail is great. And it definitely helps my paycheck for sure, because stores are crucial to the snow sports industry. But I just didn't get it. Anyone who walked in, they're like, what kind of ski should I get? And they're like, I have this bullshit from 10 years ago. And I'm like, well, anything on the wall is going to be better than what you have right now. And then they carried line skis too. And I was a line skis ambassador and I was all about it. And I was just like, well, take these line skis. So I was basically trying to put lines on every person that walked in the door. Some people, they probably shouldn't have been on line skis. <laughs> and so I wasn't that good. In my three-month review of that, they're like, yeah, you suck at being a retail salesman. But I was also on the side working for the owner doing their print ads and their marketing signage because I was a graphic designer too. And I was making all these crappy little ads that were in seven days newspaper in Burlington and all these other things. And I had the wherewithal to be like, okay, I'll do this, but it's a skilled job. I want to be paid more money. 
And they're like, okay, we'll pay you more money, but you can't work 40 hours a week. So I was only working like 10 hours a week doing graph design, making the same amount of money. So that was kind of my first hustle into a skilled labor job. So I did that for like two or three more months. And at that time, line was rolling with K2 out in the West Coast. And there was a job that had come up that was like the marketing coordinator and team manager for line skis and full tilt boots, which had just came out of nowhere. Yep. And my brother lived in Seattle and I saw it and I was like, Jay, what's up with this job? He's like, ah, you don't want it. Seattle sucks or whatever. And he was kind of like not into the idea. And bless her heart, Kareen, his wife is like, dude, just hire Josh. Jason was on the forefront of like, he knew the internet was going to take off. Yep. And he needed someone out there who worked like Microsoft, who like knew the internet. At the time, that's what you said, knew the internet or digital guy or whatever. And I wasn't really that person. I was more of just a skier who was passionate about it and young and stupid. And so Kareen kind of, after the fact of me being hired, she's like, oh yeah, I told him to hire you. And we literally did an interview at his house and I'm just like, yeah, let's try it. It was around this time of year, like January. Because you started right around the trade show, right? Yeah. My first day was the trade show. And yeah, it was Martin Luther King Day weekend. So he's like, okay, I want to hire you, but you got to meet my bosses and everybody. At this time, a 22-year-old, I'm flying out by myself to Seattle to meet with the president of K2 Sports and the VP of marketing. And super intimidating, but it was really easy because my brother and his wife lived out here. So I stayed like the weekend just to see what the place was like and did the craziest interview on a Friday and just basically met everyone at K2. They put you in the room with 15 different people. Oh, yeah. I met everyone. Like the people were like, why am I interviewing? Like I work for K2 and you're the line guy. And there was a lot of animosity there too, because it was K2. Yeah. And they're like, what's up with these line guys? It was a brand of K2 Sports, but they didn't want line there. I won't name names, but people were like, why the hell are we buying line skis? We should just buy them and kill them. Or like full tilt is never going to be a brand. That's like never going to be cool. So I was walking into the lion's den there. And yeah, that weekend, it was my brother's birthday, I think. And we had like a little party in the parking lot at Alpenthal and lot four there and just skied 18 inches of powder. And Jay set me up with some powder skis out there. And he called me on like a Sunday. They're like, okay, you're not crazy. They want to hire you. Do you want the job? And I'm standing there and I'm like, I got to think about it. And then I got to look around. And I'm just like, this is a heaven on earth zone and like an opportunity that I cannot pass up. So I was like, yeah, of course. And so within two weeks of that coming back home, I was flying to the trade show in Vegas for my first day of work. And Ben Wallace, who was the sales manager at the time, he handed me a computer and he's like, welcome aboard. Here we go. <laughs> and then Jay's like, do you know how to build a wall? <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> And so at the time we were, well, we still kind of do it is you basically show up the trade show with a blank space, go to Home Depot, buy a bunch of two by fours and screws and nails and then build your trade show booth. That was like my first day. Did you return the booth those years? Uh, it was so cheap. We just left it there for like the union workers. It was all good wood and everything. So they're like, oh yeah, we'll take all this yeah. stuff. So those years were crazy. And I'd never been to Vegas. I mean, I'd barely flown on that many planes at the time. It was a quick transition from college, after college, not really working that much to game on. And yeah, at age 22, I moved to Seattle and have been there ever since for 11 years now, I'd say. Do you ever regret not taking that two years post-college to just enjoy life? Absolutely. Oh my God. It's kind of weird. I mean, being the brand director, the guy running Full Tilt and Line, in my career, it's been the longest job I've had at the company. And so... To be the brand director at age 28 when I started was a little bit weird. I, I'd introduce myself. I mean, I'm bald and I can speak pretty well. I'm like, yeah, I'm 28 years old. They're like, what? I thought you were like 40. <laughs> so it was weird. And I do wish I did do that two or three years of bumming around, washing dishes and just skiing. But you would have missed all your windows. I'd missed it. So like the opportunity was there. And then working for a few years in the office, I don't know, I just couldn't bring myself to going back to that. I like having a paycheck and things like that. So. And your gig's not a bad gig. When no. you get that job, you're traveling a ton. You're working way more than you ever anticipated you'd ever work. Because when you start at a company like K2 or Line and you get that job, are you one of those dudes that just wants to be working as much as possible to make as much shit happen for the brand? Yeah, because it was everything reflected on the brand and you had total control and power over it. I was the only Line skis, well, me and Nathan, the graphic designer, in Seattle. And Nathan wasn't going to make decisions. You were the decision maker. Yeah. Well, Jason was my boss. I was hired by Jason in Vermont to move to Seattle to work with him in Vermont. So he was my long distance boss for six years. And so our relationship was great in that way where he gave me the creative freedom to, to do a lot of things and to figure out what's going on. Oh, there's a new social media platform called like Facebook. Maybe we should have a page on it. 
you know, or like just finding all this other stuff. So I started the Instagram, the Facebook, the, the whatever. I think I started and closed our MySpace page over that time. And it was just a lot of discovery. And every year at the time, as a brand and people in skiing, they thought it was much bigger than it actually was. We were only selling about three or 4,000 skis before K2 Sports bought us. Wow. And are you at liberty to say how that's grown? Not 3,000 and not 100,000, that's for sure. But it's definitely a lot more. But at the time, we were growing 100% every year. Wow. And then with full tilt boots, the same thing. Granted, you're turning a nickel into a dime, but it was fast and it was fun. It was like, what can we do better next year? Or wow, that was really not the way we, we should have run this campaign or these things were here. Nothing was the same every year for like four or five years, which was awesome. I mean, that growth was crazy. And we were basically filling into the distribution channels of having a bigger back end, having a bigger factory that actually delivered on time and made good product and things like that. It was that natural growth that the parent company saw. It was like, oh yeah, these guys are going to grow to this. And so they didn't really have to invest that much into us. They were just seeing that. And so those years of growth were crazy. And at the time, it seems like totally normal for everyone to have rocker twin tip, you know, every shape ski there is now. But back in the day, it really wasn't that much going on. I mean, K2 was doing some cool stuff. We came out with the EP Pro, which was a crazy looking ski with Pollard, kind of at the same time as the Hellbent. And those really changed the way that people looked at skiing. And it was cool to be a part of that because it's all new. I'm going to take one more sponsor break and I'm going to start with Spy Optic. Spy has been around since 1994, so they have a long history supporting snow sports. And this year, they've produced the best goggle ever made, the Ace EC. That's a bold statement, but it's three lenses at the push of a button. I asked pro podcaster Mike Powell if he had a chance to try the Ace EC. Dude, I have. It's crazy. I used it this weekend on a day where we had sun, we had snow, we had clouds, and three lens options meant I never had to think about changing my lenses while my friends were pretty much screwed. The ACC is a game changer, and you're going to have to pay full price for the best goggle in the world. But to save 20% on everything else SPY, head on over to spyoptic.com, place your order, then use the code CAPITAL TPM, the number 20, that's all one word, and you will get that 20% when you check out. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They make beer and like to drink it outside, and the beer they make is awesome. And when they're not making or drinking their awesome beer outside, they're supporting some of the coolest projects and events in snow. There's the Pray for Snow movie, a film that 10 Barrel produced with writers Eric Jackson, Ben Ferguson, Lucas Wax, and more. And in March, they're going to be hosting three different Hella Big Air events. And currently, they're working with Mike Bassich to create a Snowcat mini pub. And they help make this podcast happen. And that's just the beginning. Next time you're out buying beer, support the brand that supports you, the 10 Barrel Brewery. You can find out more about the events, their pubs, and the beer over at 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. For you, you're a kid that goes from having posters of Eric Pollard on your wall I was a really big fan of Pollard, actually. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't get it. I was like, this dude's just doing rodeos into powder and stuff like that. And I was into Vincent Dorian and Dave Crichton and like freestyle guys. And over the years, I consider Eric one of my best friends. And, you know, I get it. I see the light of what he's trying to do. He can really explain his version of skiing much better. Well, you rained on where I was going to go saying you had posters on your wall of Eric Pollard. Then you graduated to getting a job in-house where you got to work with Eric Pollard and he's an athlete. And now he's one of your best friends. So it's got to be a weird thing where your idols, even though Eric wasn't your idol because you didn't <laughs> like him at all when he was younger. Sorry, Eric. But he is now a co-worker and best friend. It's just weird how that happens in life. Oh, yeah. People always ask, what's the thing that's keeping you in skiing? It's like, well, I like to go skiing. I am not a hedge fund manager, so I can't just go heli skiing or things like that. So I worked my way into the industry in order to afford myself those opportunities. But then it's the people. I mean, when you meet like-minded people anywhere around the world, it's crazy how quickly you can be in France and meet a few riders of yours that you didn't know the day before, and you're totally on the same plane. Because you're just totally into the same stuff. I can't think of any other industries. I mean, maybe scuba diving or snowboarding, obviously, and things of that nature, where you have that type of connection with total strangers all around the world. So it's a small community, but it's definitely the world of skiing. So hate to get all sentimental, but that is one of the things that keeps me in it for sure. I'm going to get back to the brands and J-Lev. So 
how much control do you have? I mean, does every decision have to be run through Jason in those early days? And is he flying out to meetings and you're kind of silent more in the meetings where he's doing the talking and you're going to be doing the work? I was the executor of stuff. I mean, Jake could come up with one of his best quotes is like, dude, that just takes five minutes. Everything took five minutes. It didn't matter what it was. It was just like that. That just takes five minutes. And I understood it, too, because we were kind of in the same wavelength of like, yeah, we could do anything we want. And, you know, some other people that we work with, I won't name names, was like, it doesn't just take five minutes. It's like, this is a difficult thing to do. But in those times, I mean, Jason, he's an amazing presenter. He has the weight of doing everything and succeeding and failing at basically every part of the snow sports industry and learning from that. So he was the face of Lion Skis, which is totally fine by me. I don't want to be the face of Lion Skis. And yeah, at the time, it was great. We'd be a tag team on a lot of stuff, things that he was better at, he'd do, and things that I was good at, I'd do. I mean, he's 10 years older than me or so. So there was a little bit of generational gap. I mean, it was a big gap when the internet came around. Jay had a flip phone up until about six or seven years ago. Okay. He loved his flip phone. And, and I was like, dude, <laughs> there's phones there connected to the internet. Yeah. So he gave me a lot of freedom and creative freedom to figure things out. And I was the eyes and ears in our main office. So I knew the the resources we had. And I had much closer relationships to a lot of the engineers and the shared services that we had. So we were able to use his overarching visions and passion and actually create really good product and work with really good people. That's for sure. And at this time, you're the marketing coordinator and you're the team manager and the team manager tag has stuck with you forever. <laughs> Everybody calls you the team manager, but you are yeah. the global brand director of two of the greatest brands in skiing. And when I think of the second brand in Full Tilt Boots, was that a brand that Jason wanted to revive or was that something that the people in the corporation were saying, hey, we need to generate more revenue and one way to do it is to buy this boot brand. And Jason's like, give it to me. I'll make it successful. Yeah, it was kind of this add-on that no one really saw it coming. But Full Tilt, the original Reikley Flexon mold, which is the most popular ski boot in the 80s and 90s, through mismanagement of the business and it went away and, and everyone knows the story of Seth Morrison and all these guys getting parts on eBay because the product just worked really well. And so the CEO at the time at K2, he bought those molds or found them. I mean, there's all lore story of, of what's going on. We had those molds. So there was a name, Full Tilt, which was a wakeboard company that K2 owned the rights. They acquired it through Ride, I believe. Yeah. So there was a name and a product. And so at the time, the K2 guys were like, dude, you're never going to make that boot cool. This is ridiculous. If we're going to want to start a ski boot category, which they're doing really well with ski boots now, but it took a while to get there. They're like, you're never going to make this cool. Like, we don't want anything to do with it. And so the CEO kind of dug his heels in and he's like, well, fuck you. I'm going to do this myself. <laughs> and at the time, you had... Jay Leventhal, one of the best branding and positioning people in the business, and he showed him the boot and said, what can you do with this thing? He's like, dude, I skied in that boot for 15 years doing moguls. I know why it works. And from there, we launched it and introduced it to an entirely new generation of freestyle skiers that it looked like a new boot or something totally different, and then reintroduced it to everyone that knew the Reikley Flex on. So it was this like perfect storm of having a product that worked with minimal changes. I mean, we put intuition on there. We made the buckles a little stronger and things like that. And there was definitely some issues in the first few years, but people wanted this product. And it was a very conscious choice to make it not the line boot because that would niche it into a freestyle type consumer and every line guy would have to be on this boot. We made it its own brand because one, Seth Morrison was touting it like crazy. There was all these other riders out there that weren't online that could help drive this boot. And so from then on, it was, you're running two brands. You're wearing two hats at all times. That's interesting because it's got to be hard to keep your head above water when you're just working with line. But then when you work with full tilt, it's a totally different animal because every athlete wants those boots, it seems like, especially on the competition level. And just the seeding the market with boots seems oh like God. a full-time job. Yeah, it was gnarly. And to this day, people are still just calling every day of being like, if these guys are riding, it must be good. Can I try a pair? And so if CR Johnson calls up and wants some boots, you're going to give them to him. Or if Bodie Miller calls up customer service, which he did like two years ago and was just like, I'm a believer in this boot. You're going to send it to him. So yeah, our team is basically people just get free boots because it's just we're the smallest boot brand in the world. But to be able to get it out there and have that much clout, riding the boots is great. On the other hand, what people don't realize and what I don't think we've done a good enough job of communicating is that boot is so good for every type of skier out there. Like it opens completely open. You can just slide your foot into it. They're warm. They're light. The flex is perfect. It's interesting. And as a marketer, as a brand position guy, 
it's difficult to decouple it from the freestyle and the free ride and, and the core consumers. Like those guys, they understand it, but the 99% of the rest of skiing, some people would see it as an old boot or something that wouldn't work for them, but it actually, the, the advantages of the thing are insane. I skied that boot for 10 years and there's a lot of advantages for the freestyle skier, like you say, but you don't even have to describe that to the regular person. You put your foot in a full tilt boot and it doesn't hurt and you're comfortable all day and it's light. And to me, that was a great thing until Ryan McBride sent me K2 heated boots and I really like the heat. <laughs> but I rode those boots every day for 10 years, had minimal boot work and no problems. And that's the beauty of those. To get that shift of people's mindset of this thing works for everybody is a much bigger process. And that's a cool challenge that I have for sure. And our team has, because I think skiers are doing themselves a disservice by putting their feet into traps, bear traps, instead of just a full on nice comfy boot that performs for you, actually. Yeah. The next big thing that happens in your career is you're named as the marketing manager for Line and Full Tilt. Yeah. Well, in 2007 or eight, there was another brand that the parent company owned, which was Planet Earth Clothing. Oh, yeah, that's and right. And so Planet Earth Clothing, which the history of that is... Um, Chris Miller yeah. started a clothing oh, yeah. program and he was a famous skateboarder Legend and it was all going to be organic, natural materials. Totally. And it was board sports. It was skating, surfing, and snowboarding. And that was part of Earth products, so Audio Shoes, Holden, and Planet Earth. And that had gone by the wayside and some shifts in the organization. So we had this brand name and me and Jay being the gluttons for punishment we are, we were asked to relaunch it into the market. And so for two or three years, we were running Planet Earth Clothing, Full Tilt Boots, and Line Skis. And Planet Earth Clothing is spring, summer, and fall, winter categories. Like at the time, you have outerwear, streetwear, all this other stuff, and then talking to a much bigger audience. So we were going against Element and all these huge, huge brands, but our positioning was so on point at the time. This obviously went away because we're not talking about it right now, but we couldn't make a t-shirt for under like $100. Our supply chain and manufacturing was just totally fucked. But the positioning, along with Mark Fankhauser, who is one of the best designers in the world who worked at the company at the time, it was so on point. And we didn't have the budget or the resources to have a huge athlete team or anything. That's what everyone else was doing. And so... In the world of line and full tilt, you know, we don't have a big athlete team. We have a few big name riders, Wallace and Pollard and the traveling circus guys. We weren't afforded to sign Sean White or sign whatever. So we did these cool three-part video series with really interesting people in those worlds or who used to be in those worlds. We did one with Dave Sione down in Portland. He's a legendary snowboard filmmaker and pro snowboarder. He was married to Sherry McConkie. Really? Oh, I just learned something today. A long time ago and since divorce and they're friendly. I had no idea. Yeah. Super nice guy. And he makes high-end furniture now. And so his story was so cool. And we'd send Chris Osnes, who was an old line rider, over and film these guys and cut up these cool little videos. And in 2018, that's a super viable marketing strategy. I mean, you see Yeti does it now. And everyone's pulling out these kind of everyman or people with unique stories and putting them up there. But at the time, it was pretty revolutionary because no one was really telling the stories of not the super athletes or whatever of the day. And so we did one on them, DJ A-Dog in Burlington. God rest his soul. Really great guy. He was big into skateboarding and he basically brought hip hop up to Burlington. And then we did one on Marginal Way Skate Park, the DIY skate park in Seattle. And this was a total divesture from the ski world, the tiny little niche freestyle freeride ski world that was so fun to do for two or three years. And it was unfortunate it, it didn't take off. Well, you were ahead of your time there with the product and the marketing. The videos that you said were stuff that's commonplace now, but didn't happen back then. And then the products, that was when people just started talking about green stuff and being natural. Oh, and it's such bullshit. I think brands have kind of pulled back a little bit from the greenwashing. It's yeah. like you have one product that has recycled plastic in it and suddenly you're like this green Patagonia type thing. Like Patagonia is doing a great job, but you're still making product and selling it and shipping it around the world. There's a major carbon footprint there. But we were making a jacket out of PET material in China, and we come to find out it was made out of plastic bottles. But we come to find out they're buying plastic bottles from a plastic bottle factory to make the fucking jackets. That's crazy. And so you're just like, dude, it's such a slippery slope, and you're going to get called out. The last thing I ever want to do is be dishonest in our marketing or, or whatever we're doing. So it's so difficult when someone's like, what's your green story this year? And it's Green stories on the marketing side aren't really there. It, it should be just in packaging and shipping and things that can help mitigate the impact of the environment there. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. 
Okay, so we were going where I was saying you hired Dan Brown. You let me know that you had another hire before, Ryan McBride, who ended up moving on to be the sales manager. And now he's the sales manager of K2, and he's crushing it. Oh, yeah, everyone leaves us. Yeah, they do. And we'll talk about (laughs) Will in a little bit as well. But then you hired Dan Brown. And Dan's in-house for about seven months before j pulls the plug and he's gone, I think. No, he had left. It was just me and Jay. Shit, that must have been five or six years ago now. Jason's been doing that. So the last year Jay was there, he had been doing this for 15, 20 years already. And so in natural progression of, of anyone's lives, you want something different. And that fateful day of him calling me, I wasn't in the office either. And he's like, yeah, I'm going up to Seattle. I'm going to do a budget meeting and all this stuff. And he's like, and by the way, I'm leaving. (laughs) And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, and I want you to take over. I mean, you've been my right-hand man and you you know what's going on. And I didn't really see that coming. I mean, I was looking for other jobs and stuff at the time because I'd hit my ceiling and I'm like, Jay runs these brands and that's where it's going to be and opportunities are elsewhere. And I was super thankful for it. But yeah, that was kind of a big shift in what the future looked like. And from there, Jason left and started his ski brand and we're still friends to this day. And then suddenly I was the brand director. You went from being number two in making decisions to all the decisions going on your shoulders, <laughs> and st- unless someone said from above said, hey, you can't do this. Yeah. But that didn't happen that often. And was that extra responsibility, did that weigh on you at all? Or was it just something you were ready for? I was ready for it because Jason afforded me so many opportunities to keep me involved in every part of the business. And I naturally want to learn every part of the business. Like I want to see the guy that puts the skis in the box at the factory. And the guy who puts the skis in the box at the factory looks a little different than you and I. (laughs) Sorry to get off topic, but was there any backlash from the skis being put in a box in a different country? Oh, I mean, you're always battling that made in China moniker where it's like, oh, this is just China made crap. You've been there. What's it like? It's great. I mean, everyone there is super stoked. It's definitely a different cultural experience of visiting our ski factory than our ski boot factory in Italy near Venice. But everyone's happy. And it's factory number two, actually, in, in China. It's humming like crazy. It's huge. It's high-tech, state-of-the-art stuff. And everyone there is on the same page. They're just in a different country. I mean, you got a lot of other ski brands are like made in the EU. It's like, yeah, dude, your stuff's made in Bulgaria. It's just another country. But yeah, that moniker and the the nationalism that we have around is is pretty interesting. With skiing especially, it's a upper middle class to, you know, white bread. I mean, let's be honest. It's rich white people who are thinking everything's in Austria and and not thinking about a, a global economy. And yeah, there's always that issue. But, you know, if if you're making innovative shapes, delivering them on time and making really cool stuff and telling good stories about them, I mean, it's it's whatever. I mean, the room we're sitting in, I'm I'm sure a lot of things are made in China, which is totally fine. So what (laughs) changes for you when you take that global brand director title and Jay's out of the picture? That's all on me. I think any leader of a brand, a company, a household, whatever, it should all fall on you at some point or other. You You should be the end all of making decisions, good or bad, and owning the bad ones giving the right praise to the right people that made the good decisions happen. It's not me. I'm not making the skis. I'm not doing every part of it, but I'm touching every part. And from there, it was just a real quick baptism into a significant amount of responsibility. I was 28 at the time. And so that was pretty intense. And it was just me for a few more months. And I was like, shit, I got to hire somebody (laughs) like really quick or I'm going to go insane. It was quick. But then from there, I sharpened my pencils and looked at everything and figured out how I wanted to operate the brands. And Filling the shoes of Jason Leventhal is very difficult. And you know, I still get, you know, some old dealers and stuff being like, Hey, where's Jay? And like, uh, and it's like, what? Really? Like, get on the internet, man. Like he is your number one competitor. Yeah, totally. And so he was there. So my role wasn't like, I'm going to be the face of line skis. I'm going to be the man. Like, I'm going to do all this stuff. Like here I am. This is kind of a self-serving podcast thing here, but I just want to tell the story. And the first thing I did was actually sign Tom Wallace. That's something Jason Leventhal would never have done. To his credit, actually, before Tom was Tom, he sent me one of his videos or we were sending back and forth. And he's like, I've never seen anyone like this skiing. How can we get him? And I remember before he signed with Scott, skiing with Tom because he was on Full Tilt at the time. And Full Tilt was a little easier sponsorship to do. I mean, it was royalties. That was basically it. And he didn't have an agent or he had just got an agent. And so I was like, dude, we want you on the team. And he's like, sorry, man, I'm literally about to sign something big. And we didn't have the budget and whatever. So he went through Scott and everything like that. And that was probably one of the hardest negotiations and signings. It took six or seven months. You had to convince your boss, who at that time is Matura, that we need to spend all this money on this guy and it's going to make a huge impact. And sometimes there are people that are blind to seeing what Wallace brings to the table. Absolutely. My knowledge of it was he wasn't just a big name writer or whatever. Like his brand was bigger than Lion Skis. 
And that's only one part of Tom Walsh's world. I mean, you've interviewed him. I mean, he's so pro at every part of being a professional athlete. It's yep. crazy. He'll get back to you within 24 hours anywhere he is in the world. Whereas some amateur riders, that, that never happens. You know, they just don't see that part of it. He'll talk to a dealer about like his skis and how they should be placed in the wall. Like when we first started developing his skis, he's a business major. He's just like, what's our margin we're making on this? Or what, what kind of <laughs> price point are we going at? Because his Scott skis were way too overpriced for what his consumer was. And to have a, a rider that understands that stuff and who can also stoke out a 10 year old kid in Germany who doesn't speak his language and the biggest fan of his to also having a normal conversation with the CEO of GoPro or being good friends with the VF Corp president. He's one in a million. It's crazy. But at the time of signing him, and I, I brought up the idea to him and his agent, it was weird because they're just like, he's off of Scott and he's going to go to some big company, Atomic Vocal, whatever. And I had to convince them that Tom should hang his hat on his products, his fans. And so his first skis were line skis. As a kid in Pittsburgh, that was the brand that he was like, this is who's speaking to me. And that's who I'm going to get my twin tips from. So to convince him of that and then to basically sculpt the entire partnership with product and with everything, it was a big deal. And to come back around to how I want to operate the brands is I didn't want to be the face of the brand. The athletes and the people out there should be the face of the brand. So I would just be the Wizard of Oz guy in the back pulling the strings. Unless there were ads in the mid 2000s with Josh doing backflips in them. (laughs) There wasn't, was there? No. I thought we saw you a couple times in there, but it doesn't There matter. was a Planet Earth clothing ad that was about the vibe of the ad, but I was in it. It was tough to have skiers involved in the Planet Earth clothing lexicon there because skiers are dorks. Is that a challenge to you, though? Because skiers are dorks, but you're a skier, and then you also have this other company that think they're so much cooler than what your passion is, and you're managing both of them. You do put skiing in it, but is that a tough pill to swallow? It doesn't matter what your internal passions are when you're running a brand. It's more of who you're talking to and what kind of imagery and vibe you want to put out. And so you have to, yeah, swallow those pills and and do your own thing because managing three different brands at the time, Planet Earth, Full Tilt Boots, and Line Skis, they were talking to three different people, more or less. There was some overlap in there, but yeah, the fun part of the mid part of my career, I guess, at that point was brand positioning and marketing to all these different types of consumers. So very cool. Looking at your whole career, you've done a ton in skiing. And while it just started as a passion as a kid that you were pushed into by your parents, and then it became your whole life, you were able to do more with skiing than most pro athletes. I mean, you've probably traveled to more places and done a lot of things than a lot of the athletes. So the desk job that you have is one that's created so many opportunities. And like you said, You've reached the ceiling before where there's only so much higher you can get. Right now, you've been the global brand director for five, six years. And where do you go from here? I mean, could you be content with the career being the global brand director of line skis and full tilt boots forever? Or is it something where one day you see yourself as CEO of K2? What does the future look like for Josh Malchak? Good question, because no one knows what the future looks like for anybody is the thing. I thought I might be at K2 for life until like K2 started changing. (laughs) Exactly. You have your daily wake up of, of, am I happy? Am I comfortable? And am I challenging myself? And then, you know, you look down one month and what am I going to get accomplished with what I'm doing now? And then, yeah, there's definitely future plans for sure, but I don't really know what they are. I'm just kind of being my own person and doing the best work I can possibly do and working with the right people. So if, if I'm happy and hopefully healthy and aware of opportunities that come up or where things can go, so be it, but bring it on. I wish I could have a much more clairvoyant idea of what the future holds, but who knows? Well, Josh, I'm at the part of the show where we jump into inappropriate questions. Oh. And I had someone who has had a major impact on your career ask you the inappropriate questions. We talked about him a lot. His name's Jason Leventhal. Oh, boy. And I'm going to start with question number one. Tell us about the ridiculous amount of time you spent in a three foot by four foot outdoor steel booth in Burlington while you're going to college and what you spent your time doing in there. Jason wants to know about the ridiculous amount of time you spent in a three foot by four foot outdoor steel box in Burlington as you would not answer his first inappropriate question. (laughs) It was my parking garage job in college. (laughs) That's That's the beauty. But with that job, it afforded me hours of sitting in a booth and nothing really to do. It was like during the day, so people didn't really come and go. So you're just pulling your hair out? 
No, I had my computer and I basically was just editing videos for line for right side productions doing that. And then there was a restaurant right next door. I became friends with all those guys. So I gave them free parking and they gave me free dinners and it was a nice restaurant. So I'd like have my, <laughs> my menu out there and they'd serve me my dinner like in it. And I'd have this like super fancy dinner going on <laughs> out in the booth. Yeah. I think everyone should have super shitty jobs in their life when they're a kid for sure, because those jobs can show you what kind of opportunities there are, how you can kind of hack it into making it into something that, that can be a career. So never thought that would shape my actual adult career. All right, we're going to jump into question number two. Josh is really good at scheming and making something out of nothing and getting it done. That's why we work so well together. Josh, why don't you tell the college kids out there how you were somehow able to put on super legit rail jams on your campus and even downtown with literally no money, no corporate backing, and just able to convince all the public officials and everyone you needed that somehow everything was in order and you just rallied your buddies to get out there and make it happen. Sounds like you're able to throw some events that you had no business throwing. How did you make that happen? Yeah, we had like the the Burlington Winter Festival, which was like a bunch of snowman making contests and ice sculptures and stuff like that. My friend Jared Moss there, who runs Ski Sundown in Connecticut, he was the pioneer of the downtown rail comp there in Burlington. And basically, I took that on of just being like, we just wanted to slide rails and do events like on campus. And in order to do that, you had to get insurance and you had to make it look like a legit event company that was putting it on. So Right Side Productions and Events was our company. And talking to the people at University of Vermont, getting insurance from line skis down the way, like Jay was all about it. So he'd just sign over his insurance policy. I don't know if that was a good idea. But yeah, I was just scheming on being able to, to, having an end goal of wanting to do something for the fun of you and your friends and throw a party, but figuring out all the legal ways to do it in order to make anything run smoothly was the way I could really manage myself. Any trouble ever come out of those events that you put together? Oh, I almost killed Whit Foster. He was an old line rider of ours. I've known him forever. He's from Charlotte, Vermont. And we had this one on Redstone Campus in UVM. And we had these three rails that we had Sundown make for us that we could drag anywhere in the world. And it was so cold. And he was a young up and coming rider and he crashed. And he like punctured his lung. Oh, And so he was in the hospital. He couldn't fly because of the pressure and all this other stuff. And I was just so nervous for him. I thought one of our events killed this guy. Everything's all good and fun until someone gets hurt. And in the ski and snowboard world, I've known a lot of people that have gotten seriously hurt or killed. And it's just like, that's the worst feeling in the world. So that was the only bad thing that kind of happened. I mean, we broke some windows and stuff by accident, but you know, it's all there. And the events were always really fun and got the community together in the university. And they're all about just having more and more events. So it was cool. All right. We will go with our final inappropriate question. In college, Josh made lots of ski videos with his friends like most of us. And of course, he thought he was a hardcore rapper slash park skier known for his baggy, what looked like a one-piece suit, but it was his jacket and pants. The colors was always matched. And he had one trick, kind of a one-hit wonder that he lived by. He could do it off any jump, small or large. Can you still... Do the Lincoln Loop, Josh. So Jason doesn't come with the inappropriate questions. I don't like inappropriate questions. Well, I mean, it's good for you because you don't have any tough ones to answer. But we asked this to Mike Douglas if he would still do a D-spin every year. He was saying he would do one at 50. While you aren't 50, you sure look it. That's a joke. (laughs) But feel it. Are you still doing Lincoln Loops? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a pretty simple go-to trick. It's a real crowd pleaser. I mean, the backy is the crowd pleaser. I can still do those for sure. Much smaller than previous years. You used to have doubles, right? No, I did like one in my life and it was in a Meathead movie. Which one is it in? Head for the Hills. It's in Head for the Hills. It's on the internet somewhere. Yeah, that was my one and only time I did that. And that was just silly. But yeah, I could definitely still do that side whack flip Lincoln Loop type thing and sometimes pull it around to a 540 and do a rodeo and It's just one of those kind of aesthetic tricks too. Like if there's a pro photographer near me, I could say, here, point this thing in my direction and do one. And I'm definitely a parrot. I like seeing pictures of myself. So there's a whole bunch of them out there. And actually in Coble, the last time I was skiing with my friend, Chris Rudolph, who actually died the following year at Stevens Pass, we were skiing together and Coble was up there at Stevens shooting with Casey Dean. And we found this cool little bump and I did one off that and it actually landed in powder the next year, which was pretty cool highlight of my life of like being like, wow, I'm in the photo gallery of powder magazine, which was totally cool. And and not because of your job. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it was because I was wearing good colors and stuff. It all kind of went together, but it's cool having those physical time capsules of your life and of, of that time and brings you back to them. That's cool. And hopefully I can do that stuff until I'm definitely old. All right. My last question it doesn't have anything to do with Jason, but I should have asked it way earlier. When you moved out to Seattle and you're a young, wide-eyed kid who has no idea what he's walking into, were we welcoming to you? Because that is something I don't know. You would have to answer that. Fuck no. It was that year that you guys had that amazing, like... Camp K2. Camp K2. And I was there for two weeks, and I'm like, wait, you guys are closing down Mount Baker for like three days, and can I go? I'll wear a K2 t-shirt or whatever. And they're like, no, you're the line guy. (laughs) And then it turned out to be like the most amazing three days ever of skiing at Mount Baker private with like every pro in the world. So yeah, I'm a little annoyed by that, but I won't take it to my grave. I won't hold you accountable for it forever. Fair enough. Well, Josh, I thank you for your time. I know you need to get back to the office so you can get work done before you head out to Hawaii, but it's been cool to watch your career, man. I remember your first day coming into Seattle. I remember we were walking out the back door and I think I met you walking in and they were like, that's the new line guy. And we were all confused that we had line in-house as it was. And from there on, we didn't invite you to Camp Tay too, but I think shortly after that, everyone started hanging out and everything was great. No, no, it's, it's been awesome. And it, the experiences are there too, for sure. But it's, it's all about the people and it's been a really cool career and I'm happy for it. And I got to congratulate you, a hundred podcasts and here's to a lot more of them. And now I got to hopefully prepare for our trade show that we're completely unprepared for, hire a new marketing manager and get back into winter. All right, kids. Well, if you want a marketing manager job, Josh (laughs) is hiring. I think the starting salary is about 125 grand. You work about 20 hours a week. It's pretty easy. You get to ski a lot. Super easy. I mean, they just uh, give me real money sooner. It used to be just free skis. So that was time with Josh Malchisiak. And while I've known Josh for a long time, I didn't know much of his backstory. And it's pretty cool to hear. I mean, I thought Josh was bald his whole life. And I learned in this podcast that he had hair and it was pink. Crazy. But what I find really awesome about this podcast is that I never really realized that Line being early adopters of the internet as a primary marketing vehicle was all about Josh. While Jason Leventhal may have had the vision to use this new free marketing tool, he was on a flip phone. It took someone like Josh who gets the industry and the technology to place Line at the forefront of this type of marketing in the digital age. So kids out there, don't let anyone shit on your dreams and make them happen. But make sure you take two years off to live the real lifestyle first and then work your way behind the scenes. That's the podcast for this week. I want to thank my sponsors for making the show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Spy Optic. I want to thank you for listening and have a great week, everyone.